Hello to all of our coaching fans and coaching constituents uh, with USA Wrestling. We have uh, a very special production today. We've got uh, our very, very first, what we call Coaches Council Heads Up podcast. And it's Mike Clayton, um, who is a uh, manager of our coaches education program at USA Wrestling, who's joining us. And, and none other than Bruce Baumgartner. Bruce, we are so excited to have you with us. Bruce plays so many roles, past and present, with USA Wrestling. And uh, welcome to both of you guys. Mike, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Mike? Good to have you with us. Thanks, Mike. No, I'm excited. I'm like a kid in a candy store talking to both of you guys today. So this is pretty cool. Yeah, we're definitely going to have some fun. And and uh, this podcast is being brought to your way by uh, the Coaches Council with USA Wrestling, uh, a group that uh, has kind of two charges. Uh, one, to communicate from the coaches to USA Wrestling on items from the grassroots floor to get that information back to USA Wrestling. And also as a sounding board from USA Wrestling to get information out to the coaches and the various regions. And we'll bring people up to date more and more as we go throughout these podcasts, which we're gonna try to air at least once every couple of weeks. And we'll be bringing on different guests to have coaches and people uh, in, the, in the USA Wrestling community. But I, I figured we might as well start with the best of the best. So we bring Bruce Bobgarner in here and holy cow, I don't know where we're gonna go after this one. Bruce, <laughs> again, thank you so much for joining us, man. Mike, my pleasure. I, I just, as president of USA Wrestling, I, I wanna thank all of our coaches and and volunteers that, that make USA Wrestling a great uh, organization. And, and um, you know, we understand, or I understand that the hard work of the coaches and, you know, working with our youth and, and athletes uh, at, at all ages is such an important part to the growth of wrestling. You know, not only the growth of U.S. Wrestling, but wrestling as a whole in the United States of America. And, and uh, we do appreciate uh, our volunteers and the coaches and and the people that put in the hard work, um, again, to to run wrestling programs, I think high quality wrestling programs for the youth of our country. Thanks so much, Bruce. I, I'm gonna throw the first softball up there. I'm gonna make it real easy for you. And I'm gonna <laughs> ask you the question uh, that a lot of people probably would wanna know is, Bruce, what actually got you started in wrestling? What what, what was it that, that uh, got this ball rolling for you? Well, you know, Mike, I, I started as a um, freshman in high school and. Uh, my brother was three years older than I was at Manchester Regional High School in New Jersey, a small uh, high school. I, I think we had about, uh, you know, maybe 100 kids in the graduating class or smaller. Um, he, he went out. He's three years older than I was. He'd come home, teach me how to wrestle. And, you know, we broke a lot of furniture. I took a lot of beatings in that early time period. And uh, you know, I'd go watch some practice when I was in eighth and ninth, uh, seventh and eighth grade. And, um, you know, I just, I went out for the team. It was my brother's senior year, my freshman year. And, um, you know, wasn't, wasn't a great wrestler at, at first, uh, you know, did okay JV, didn't really crack the lineup unless the coach needed me to, you know, maybe shuffle a lineup around to, uh, it was three and three varsity my freshman year, um, in high school, I had three forfeits for my wins and three losses uh, for the three I actually competed against, but I just enjoyed it. I liked it. It's pretty neat to hear you didn't start wrestling really competitively until high school. And a lot of parents feel now the pressure to start their kids and, and to start them really young. Do you see advantages or disadvantages or do you have any advice that you give folks about when to start their kids? I think today um, the programs are much more organized and, and well coached. You know, we we do have a coach's education with USA Wrestling. I think that the internet um, has made information for coaches and, and the ability to um, provide good programs at a younger age for kids. Uh, you know, we have we have safe sport for USA Wrestling at least to, to make sure that we're we're doing the right things with our youth. But I, I think to answer your question more directly, Mike, is that I, I think each person, each boy or girl is different of when they should start wrestling. You know, some kids aren't mature enough at, at you know, 12 years old to do much of anything. And, and some are mature at 
eight or nine or, or six years old. So I, I think it's the parents have to be the guide. And I think the, to, the key to me is if, if the, you know, the boy or girl is enjoying it and they want to go to practice, they're probably ready for it. If, if you're dragging them, kicking and screaming every single time, and I know there's always times where there's going to be a little bit of hesitancy to go to practice. But if it's every single time, maybe you're starting a little early. That's awesome. And what kept you so excited? I mean, did you just have a lot of fun even in those early years when maybe you didn't have the, the wins? Uh, you know, my freshman year, I took a beating from a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I started out as a 170 pounder my first uh way in I showed up in the morning for 170 the weight classes were totally different and we got to realize I'm an, a dinosaur compared to, to most of the people watching this but um you know then the, the coach handed me literally a dozen donuts and a quart of milk going away ends on the bus because he decided to wrestle in this novice tournament the varsity 170 pounder I couldn't beat the 188 pounder so I wrestled heavyweight got pinned you know, in a novice tournament, my first match at heavyweight. And, um, yeah, I thought it was going to be a long career, you know, long high school done, you know, uh, but I just didn't, I enjoyed it. You know, my brother used to kick my butt unmercifully. Um, I think just because I was a little wise guy at home sometimes to him and he was older, but uh, I just in, enjoyed the sport. And obviously I got better and better as high school went on. Uh Kind of learned how to wrestle a little bit better in college, and then, and then obviously, uh, you know, the the programs after college is where I took off. Bruce, I you know I've had an opportunity, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm aging both of us here a bit, but I've had the opportunity to watch you compete. Uh, I was in that era and got a chance to watch you wrestle uh, some amazing matches against the Tom Erickson's and those U.S. Opens and championships. Uh, then I saw you move on to the coaching career at Edinburgh, uh, then as an administrator, uh, the press, first time president at USA Wrestling, now second time president at USA Wrestling. Uh, so I've, I've watched your career over the years and it's been amazing to me. In those transitions, uh, what were those things that you took from being an athlete that helped you as a coach, that helped you as an administrator, as a leader of USA Wrestling, et cetera. What, what did you bring, what, what did you pull from that experience? Well, I think wrestling teaches you so much about life. Uh, you know, if you take what, what I felt made me a successful wrestler and that, that was, you know, I studied the sport. I, I tried to learn a lot of different techniques, training methods, and then selected kind of what worked out best for me. I, I really, um, you know, I believe I worked really hard at it. Um, I sought help from a lot of coaches in my wrestling career. You, you try to pick the brains of the, the better athletes, you know, guys like Dave Schultz and, uh, you, you know, was a, a great teacher for me. I surrounded myself with good people as far as workout partners. And, you know, you look at the Bruce Burnett's of the world, the Greg Strobel's, the, the Leroy Smith's, the, the different coaches that I had, national team coaches, and, uh, you know, Bobby Douglas, Joe C., Dan Gable, Bill Wick. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of them I owe my success to in wrestling. Well, as you become a coach or an administrator or a president of USA Wrestling, you need to have that same work ethic you need to surround yourself with good people you know all the old adages you know some people want to be the smartest guy in the room or person in the room uh, others don't want to be the smart I, I would rather be I, I don't necessarily want to be the dumbest person in the room sometimes i am just by <laughs> default but you want to surround yourself with good people that can help you be successful you know and that's why i think when you look at my wrestling career I mean, I had guys like Tom Erickson that were willing to work out with me. I was had guys like Kurt Angle and Carlton Hasselrig, and you know, I owe a ton to to um, you know Joel Greenley for coming to work out with me. Mike Fuseli, and I could name dozens of workout partners. But the same success, I think, is why um, you know I felt I was a successful coach. Is I I surrounded myself with good people. 
obviously we tried to recruit the best athletes, but the best coaches, good workout partners, provide a great environment for people. And if I didn't know something, I tried to reach out to somebody. Same thing as an administrator. I had an awesome team of of uh, coaches and, and administrators at Edinburgh University to help me. So you just surround yourself with good people and work hard. You know, try to be the first one in the office in the morning and the last one in the office in the evening and, and you know, productive work, not playing video games, but just sticking at it and, and doing your due diligence. Coach, you, you talked about this transition from high school where, I mean, you became a very successful high school wrestler, but didn't quite get the state title and maybe didn't get the recognition. And, and you know, we've got the USA Wrestling High School National Recruiting Showcase coming up at the end of March, the, the 25th through the 27th. And you were talking a little bit before we jumped on the, the recording about how a, an, an event like that for you might have really helped you have even more options for that college opportunity. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, well Mike, I think it would have had, it would have given me more options. And I, I think definitely if, if, you know, I placed third in high school state championships, I never won a high school state championship. So I didn't get recruited by some of the really big time wrestling programs at the time. And don't get me wrong, I have no regrets. I went to Indiana State. Fran McCann was my coach, did an awesome job coaching me and gave me the building box to, to you know, be a, a three-time NCAA finalist winning it my senior year. But, um, you know, I think if I would have had that type of showcase, it would have given me more options uh, had I done well, obviously. And if I didn't do well, it, it wouldn't. But, you know, I think – events like that that USA Wrestling run and this is a typical one that you know it can provide some opportunities for some of those wrestlers that maybe aren't the two or three time state champions that that want to get a little bit more exposure wrestling some other really good good wrestlers I, I think it's a great opportunity you know we did some things back then like the the junior national regionals but a lot of those were after the signing date um, you know, the, the, and we only had one signing date back in the old times. Uh, you know, now they have the early signing date and, and the later signing date. So, yeah, you know, I, I think that showcase would be a, a definite uh, opportunity for some young men and some young women. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I know I was on the mat.com this morning, and I think there's almost 60 colleges already signed up. Yeah to go check out the athletes so that's really cool yeah i think you're going to have quite a few sign up because it is a great opportunity for for both the colleges and you know we didn't we didn't have the internet zoom meetings and you know blogs and stuff back you know but when i was wrestling you, you waited for the last you know the the next usa wrestler to come out you know or, or amateur wrestling news you know it was a whole different time you know, Bruce, one of the things from my perspective, knowing you a little bit from over the years, is that uh, you've you've always seemed to very much remain true to yourself and uh, and a very humble individual. And and for being the, the owning as many world medals as yourself, uh, what do you attribute that to? Is that, is that from your family? Is that uh, maybe and most of us have all been humbled by the sport anyway, but certainly you you've been true to yourself in, in this in this uh, over the years what what would you what would you contribute that effort to well I, I I think there's a lot of things that you know we're all just human beings we're all the same um, you know we may look different some male some people but we're, we're all the same and just because I was a a very good wrestler for a portion of my life doesn't make me any better of a person than uh, you or anyone else, Mike. So I, I think, you know, yes, I, I've got some great wrestling accomplishments. I was a pretty good coach. I, you know, a president of USA Wrestling, but you still have to treat people justfully, correctly, um, you know, the way you'd want to be treated. And, and, you know, I wasn't always at the top of the heap in anything I've done, you know, whether it was wrestling. I, yes, I did get their uh, Olympic and world gold medals, but, um, you know, I took my lumps. Um, yeah, I, people don't know this. I, I might be the only NCAA champion to be pinned twice in the finals. Um, that was accurate at the time. I have not followed it, you know, for that. So we all have taken our lumps. And, and I think, you know, my, my, my dad was a, was a humble man and he 
always made sure we put things in perspective. You know, I was a great wrestler. I wasn't out there curing cancer and, uh, you know, protecting us in the military. And, and all those people are important. And today, you know, we call certain people essential workers. And, and you know, it's it's we're all important in our own way to make the world a great place, the United States a great place. And, and that's what I, I kind of try to live by, you know, just – you know, everybody, and you try to always look at things from both sides or both views, and, and you can't always, you know, we we can't always look at somebody, look at the the um, issue from somebody else's shoes because we've never lived it, but you, you try to understand all positions before you act or, or, or make a decision. Have you ever uh, had that situation with a referee where you really tried to look at their side? <laughs> <laughs> unfair question. Mike. I know. Uh, you know, I, I, Mike, I, I live my life as that I, I really don't look back and, and have a whole lot of regrets. And I, I think one thing you always have to learn from your successes and learn from your failures. And I think that is so important. And I, I think people don't always do either. And you learn from history and you have to, I, I'm kind of a little bit of a history buff in a lot of things. You, you keep, you, you learn from history but you can't dwell on it. There's no sense saying, you know, I should have never shot that takedown. I'd be a three-time gold medalist. I mean, there's no, or, in, in, you know, in a particular thing, boy, that referee kind of screwed me because you can't go back and, and, and have redos in life. You know, you have to always move forward. And, you know, I always, I, I say this and I believe this is, you know, success is really the journey of life and how you treat people and what you do with the skills and ability you have. It is not necessarily the destination. And I've reached some great destinations in my life. You know, I, I was, a, I think, a, a pretty dang good athletic director. I think I was a pretty good president the first time at USA Wrestling. Hopefully my, my uh, tenure this time will, will bode well for USA Wrestling. Dealing with the pandemic, I can tell you, is not easy, but it, it, and obviously winning the, the gold medals in the Olympics and Worlds, but it's it's the journey is the success and how you treat people and, and moving along that continuum and doing the absolute best with what you have at the moment and not worrying about, you know, yes, I could have wrestled better in the, uh, you know, 1990 world champion world championships or I could have wrestled better in the 1988 Olympics. You, you can't have those back and there's no sense worrying about them. So to answer your question about the officials, the official for the 99% of the time is going to call it correct as they see it at that time. I don't think there's a whole big conspiracy, especially anymore that anybody's trying to cheat somebody. Um, Maybe back in the old FILA days and Soviet Union days, it was a little more prevalent, I'd say. But, you know, 90% of the time, and yes, we all make mistakes. I make mistakes as a wrestler. I'm sure officials make mistakes. We all make mistakes. So you move on and move forward. For our coaches in those moments, um, for you as a coach, were there things that you said to yourself or when those challenging moments came up so that you could use your, your wisdom and respond instead of react like did you develop like a like a something that that triggered that for you um i, I always try to to take a breath and, and even today when i'll get a nasty gram from somebody or or get uh, you know somebody call me up and bash me on the phone uh or when i was working at edinburgh a coach would come in and and complain about. So I was always the type of person that you always try to think and reflect. I almost never answer a, a nasty gram, as I call it. Um, the first day, I always wait. And I have written some really sarcastic, snide, absolutely miserable responses that I wouldn't be proud of if I sent. And by the next day, you think about it. And I tried to do the same thing coaching, but you know, it's, it's emotional, hard, you know, coaches and athletes put a ton of work into being successful. And then you feel like you've gotten it taken away from you because somebody didn't illegal move, somebody didn't see, or, or maybe an official was in the wrong position. And, you know, I don't believe that the officials do it intentionally or, or, 
but sometimes it happens and, and you try to take a breath and I don't I don't know that I was ever kicked out of a match or a, or a or a tournament. I, I did take a, intentionally a couple of w warnings over the years, just because you you got to make sure that the the athletes um, think you're fighting for them too. So there, it's it's a little bit of a balance. But I don't I don't remember and an ever uh, being too belligerent, maybe a little sarcastic, but a little too belligerent to an official. We have a great relationship with our officials, so it's, I know how that game goes. It's pretty fun. <laughs> Bruce, I have to ask you, in regards to, you mentioned um, your training um, and, and that, that maybe back in the day things were a little bit different, but what is it that we hear oftentimes our national athletes refer to is that the Europeans have this different feel, their, their stance is different. Uh, how did you see that as an athlete as an, and as a coach? Did did any of that reflect at, at the moment, at the time, or do you see it differently today? Well, you know, I, I think we do train a little bit different in the United States, and, you know, we have a little bit different system. Um, you know, most countries have a, a, you know, they're either competing in freestyle or Greco at somewhat of a younger age. I mean, most countries throughout the world, I don't believe they have kind of what we would have um, youth, middle school, high school, college wrestling, and then international wrestling. I, it's more of a club-based continuum throughout the world, I believe, than we have. And you know, us changing the rules makes our style a little different. You know, our athletes, um, you know, some of them that are competing at the the age group world championships are competing at a certain different level. We, you know, we have junior nationals, obviously, every year that has a, a the freestyle Greco component. You know, I think our, in a lot of ways, our, our women athletes have it a little bit better off because they wrestle less folk style and can p compare more internationally, you know, wrestling the the, the uh, freestyle rules, you know, more than than our our male athletes. But um, yeah, the, the the styles are different, but it, they're different throughout different countries. You know, the Iranians have a certain style. Even today, when I watch it, you know, and I I go to the World Championships, than some of the other countries. So it it's um, you know, it's just what what our background and what our our youth learn growing up, I think, is what, you know, how we turn out and, and um, uh, become on the international world and Olympic level. And in a way, it's, I think it's a little bit to our advantage because I don't think any of our, you know, world or Olympic champions wrestle identical in the United States, whether whether it's on the, you know, the, the men's or the women's teams. I mean, they both have a little bit of their own style, which makes it a, a tad bit, I think, more difficult sometimes to wrestle uh, the U.S. wrestlers than, you know, Iranians to me look very much alike when they wrestle, you know, very similar style. When you were coaching at Edinburgh, did you have a particular style that you felt your program was known for? Or? Well, we, you know, I, I hope to think we were in pretty dang good shape. Um, you know, I, we were maybe not in the best shape of any team, but I think we were in pretty good shape. We probably weren't the strongest of any, you know, team, but I think we were pretty strong. And, and I think we had reasonably good technique. Um, you know, we, we had some successful years. I, I didn't probably have as successful a coaching career as, as Tim Flynn did at Edinburgh, but, um, you know, we, we had some pretty good, pretty good years. We tried to have our, our um, athletes prepared uh, for the matches. And, you know, we like to turn people at, at Edinburgh, you know, even when I was coaching, you know, we didn't, we did some have some guys that took them down, let them up, but we tried to take them down, ride them, take it out of it. And we like to be pretty physical too. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, the more physical you are with somebody, the, the tired or they get in, uh, the, the less you take the will to win out of them. How about that 97 team? You look back at that a lot. Uh, you know that was that was my best team. Um, 
you know, a lot of those guys were seniors and, and um, you know, I still stay in touch with, with a lot of them. But we were very blessed over the years, whether I was the assistant coach under Mike Deanna, who hired me or, or head coach or helping Tim Flynn. We had just a lot of very, very good, um, you know, people in the program, wrestlers in the program uh, that were successful. And, uh, you know, I stay in touch with a lot of them today. It, it was just that's the great thing about coaching is making a difference in, you know, young men and young women's lives. And, and when I mean young, to me, young now is, you know, 20 to 35 even. You know, I, I quit when I was 36. But, um, you know, at my age, there's a lot of young under there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, making a difference. And you have I, – I still – like I said, we have contact and they'll come back and, you know, they'll use different sayings, uh, come back at me with the same sayings I gave them and how it's helped them. And, and it's, um, it's pretty neat when that happens. Bruce, two quick questions. One, what did you enjoy most about coaching? Number two, what did you enjoy least about coaching? Um, with hands down, Mike, the enjoyment was, um, Helping, and again, we didn't have much women's wrestling back then, but helping our team, our, our you know, 17 to 18-year-olders turn into men when they left at, you know, 21 to 23 years old. Um, and just, you know, obviously trying to help them become the best wrestlers they can be, but also the best people they can be. Help them get an education and make a difference in people's lives. That was really the best part about coaching. I really do coaching it is really just a form of education. And hopefully, as, as we talked earlier in this podcast about me, what I learned as an athlete, hopefully what I taught these or, or helped these young men learn as an athlete, I know some of them are still using it today. What I liked least about coaching um, you know, I, I would say if it was just one category, I, I I think I was a decent recruiter, but I didn't necessarily like the recruiting game. Uh, but, you know, it, it, dealing with the, the discipline issues and in, in the athletes that weren't trying to be good people, the athletes that were acting out, that took a lot of time and energy off of me. I, I couldn't really understand that because I've always been a goal-oriented person. You know, I, if I was going to be a coach, I wanted to be the best coach I could be. Didn't always turn out to be a great coach, or but, but if I'm going to be the president of USA Wrestling, my goal is to be the best president of USA Wrestling I can be. Same thing when I was an athletic administrator at Edinburgh. And you get, you know, I had some young men on the team that wanted to be on a team, but they really weren't trying to be the best they could be. And that became a little frustrating occasionally. What's something, Bruce, that you would uh, share that you feel like make make a difference for some of our new coaches in USA Wrestling, at either at the youth, high school, uh, maybe even the open level, but some of these guys that are getting in it? Because we see uh, across the board, you know, Mike and I have had these conversations about the attrition of coaches as well as athletes in USA Wrestling. Uh, what would you say to encourage them to stay with it? Well, I think it's such a rewarding to, to see and help the young men and young women grow up. Um, you know, I, I think at a young age, I believe we have to remind ourselves that, that, you know, not everybody is going to be a Adeline Gray or a Jordan Burroughs or a Bruce Baumgartner. Um, so when you coach, don't coach your whole team as if, they're going to be the next Olympian because I think what happens is, is you wear out those kids that just want to do the best they can do for that sport and go on to the next sport and the next sport. They're going to graduate high school, hopefully play sports from youth on through high school and then go on to whatever career or college they're going to go to. Um, and that's most of our wrestlers, by the way. And I think we got to keep that in mind when we're coaching. Find ways to get the, you know, again, the Kyle Dakes or the Jordan Burrows, you know, the Adeline Grays of the world to, to 
be the best they can be and, and, you know, maybe spend extra time, additional practices, find a different club for them. But, uh, you know, keep it fun for, for everybody. Cause if, if it becomes too much like work for that young Bruce Baumgartner, who wasn't that great when he first started out, who knows? I, I might not have been, been here if, if somebody would have run me off trying to, you know, coach me like a Olympic champion. I turned out to be one, but you know, it, it's, I think the, the coaches need to be cognizant of that. And for the coaches, I think, you know, we, we need, coaches out there to, to help form, you know, not only our, our young men and young women, boys and girls to be good wrestlers, but, but good people help give them. And I think in today's society more than ever, where we have, you know, more, um, split homes, more problems, uh, in society, having a good solid coach figure to, to bridge the gap on some of those issues in their lives. And, and, um, you know, I think that's where, you know, the coach's education comes in dealing with, you know, the, the even if, if you know, we have the, the, the amount of child abuse is off the chart, um, you know, if a coach can, can help identify something and, and make a kid's life better, I think, you know, that, that's an important job coaches have to, to really work with our youth and give them that leg up on the person that is not in athletics. Our coach ed office works closely with safe sport and you know we've seen that coaches because of the training have been more aware to be able to step in when they need to um, and then even some trends in the coaches that haven't necessarily um, lived up to the standards that we would hope that they do 99 percent of the time it's not that they were bad people it's that they didn't know why they were there they didn't know what their philosophy was you know a quick story from from Edinburgh, when I was AD, the, the, um, we had, I, I won't mention the sport, but we all had to go through safe sport training before, like even USA Wrestling did, because yeah, I think Pennsylvania, uh, with the Penn State issues is probably ground zero for a lot of the, the safe sport initiatives. And one of our coaches actually identified, um, a, a student going to their camp, um, that that was it wasn't sexually abused, but physically abused, and it, it really turned out to be a good thing, and it, it helped the parent and the family, and it, it really turned out to be a positive. So, uh, I'm a firm believer of of you know that coach probably helped that family stay together, and definitely helped that child, and. Um, you know, that, that's the importance of being a coach, especially a coach that has that ongoing training of not just safe sport, but good coaching techniques, good psychological, you know, dealing with the, the mental illnesses and stuff. It, it's an important job coaching. That's awesome. We've been very fortunate to have great work with the USOPC and other NGBs in our area to, to build our coach ed program. And so, I mean, it's a, a bit of a pitch, but I would love to be able to get folks mm -hmm. to Copper or bronze, our coaching philosophy course, and, and our Gable Legend Series. Um, Gable came up that he had had, I think, 48 of the last 49 World or Olympic Games that he had been to. Do you have any idea how many of the last 30 or so that you've been to? Well, I competed in 15. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to leg up on most people there. Um <laughs> I didn't medal in two of them, but I competed in 15. I had 13 World Olympic medals. Uh, one, two, three, it's probably 21-ish wow. World Olympic championships. That's pretty cool. What do you gain from being in that environment so, so often? Well, when I was competing, it was just a thrill of representing the United States of America and, and going out there and doing your best and, and challenging yourself to be the best. Um, I, I get the question all the time, why did I do it so long? And, you know, you got to put it in perspective. And I had a conversation with a great wrestler, Chris Campbell, not too long ago. And, you know, he was a little bit before my time. I, I guess he did medal in 92. So we had some overlap. But, you know, I had it better than a guy like Chris Campbell. Chris Campbell, 
Um, and, and, you know, myself and John Smith, we had it better than like the Chris Campbells of the world. Uh, but, you know, now that I think the athletes today have it a little bit better than us, we didn't do it back then. There was some financial um, rewards, but it, I did it because I loved it. And I, you know, I'd still be doing it at 60 if my body would hold out. You know, I'm a little jealous of Tom Brady being up and going with 40s. I only made 36, but, uh, you know, I, I really, um, I just loved it. And, and, you know, I still get a thrill out of going to the world championships. I, I hope to be able to go to the Olympics this summer. I hope to be able to go to Oslo uh, for the world championships and uh, assuming the pandemic allows it. But uh, just watching, I'm very proud of the United States of America. Watching our men and women compete is unbelievable to me. You know, I, I think the amount of time they put in and, and the work and the effort. And, you know, I, I wish our Greco program could, could just step it up a little bit. But it's, I mean, those guys are, are working their butts off and really trying. It's, it's not for effort. It, it's just we don't have that history or the background you know they, they don't that's not our common style you know but um i i just enjoy it now it's it's interesting because i go to some of these places and i run into some of the previous competitors that i've competed against and yeah i'm fair and okay compared to some of them you know i've had a few joint replacements but some of them look a little bit more tattered than i do <laughs> i i would have to agree bruce um Shift gears just a little bit, if you don't mind, with us and um, play. Put on the role of your president of USA Wrestling's hat, and tell us this second go around what might be a little bit different than the first time you were involved. Um, and and at, at the same time, maybe even give us uh, some direction on what you feel like where we're headed futuristically with USA Wrestling. Well, I think this the second time around. You know, I I was. Uh, you, president around 2000. And I think USA Wrestling is a much more stable, uh, larger organization, especially, you know, heading into uh, 2020, right before the pandemic, our numbers, our membership was up. Um, I, I just think we're a better organization now serving the wrestling community better. Uh, you know, I know, and, and some of the coaches watching this may shake their head and say, Bruce Baumgartner's nuts, but I think having safe sport is a huge benefit for um, our sport and our coaches. It, it provides training. It provides knowledge for them. Um, you know, I think our coaches' education, our national teams with the medal fund, um, you, you know, what we've been able to do with our coaching staff, uh, you know, we're a pretty solid organization. I, I think we're, if not the best, one of the best NGBs in the Olympic movement. And I'll go throughout the world, not just the U.S. But, um, you know, we have a, a great staff. Our volunteer base at USA Wrestling is absolutely awesome. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's a lot of the positives. The pandemic, you know, we're going to have to see how we open up uh, whether it's this summer or this fall. Uh, but, you know, for us to continue, we're going to have to open up soon. I think that's that's real important to, to get more people wrestling. Uh, there are some challenges. I mean, I think one of the big differences is social media makes it a, a lot more difficult to navigate a lot of things. Um, and what do I mean by a lot of things? It's just there, there's a lot of people that just can say or or take pot shots out of people with, you know, and that's just society right now that, that does not necessarily base in fact. I'm, I'm real proud of, you know, we're, we've got an initiative right now to look at our bylaws to make sure that we're compliant with the USOPC uh, new regulations. And I, we have a awesome athletic advisory committee uh, that is chaired by Veronica Carlson that, you know, I think we really listen to our athletes and, and not that we can always give any of our constituent groups everything they want, but um, our our governance structure is, is we, we try to listen to our athletes and we try to listen to our coaches council. We try to, you know, everybody is represented, you know, on our board, our state organizations, everybody we have, uh, 
you know, use technology to embrace a little better communications, but it is challenging. You know, also uh, one of the things I'm proud of is, you know, we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee uh, that is working right now to really analyze USA Wrestling to make sure that we are welcome to to all people that want to wrestle. And I think that is very important that, you know, we educate our uh, staff, our volunteers, our coaches, our, um, you know, volunteers to, to make sure that we're welcome for anybody that wants to wrestle. The old Bruce Baumgartner poster that, um, you know, with, with Tim Vanny, who was the 105 pounder, or me as a heavyweight that said everybody can wrestle, uh, that that really needs to be, and you know, I know they've up, I think they've revised it with with some women wrestlers on it, but we need to kind of make sure that is true and that we're not putting up barriers for, for anyone to wrestle. So I, I think that um, USA Wrestling is in a pretty good place. We, we definitely need our, our coaches and, and, you know, athletes, whether it's the youngest athlete or our uh, most senior level national team member to understand it, it is a pandemic year and, and things are different. Resources are a little bit different, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll open up, we'll get back to normal. And I, I think we'll continue to grow once the pandemic um, subsides. It's awesome. It's so nice to see. I, I've been here seven years and, and to see the difference from when I got here, even in you know, 14 to now, um, I, I see the growth in, in the professionalism. And, and I appreciate your comments about the coaches council and, and the voice that they have. And Mike, maybe you could talk a little bit about the Coaches Council and because uh, some of the coaches on here may not know really what we do uh, at the Coaches Council and, and, and that communication piece. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, earlier we mentioned that uh, the council had kind of two charges and that was number one, to be a mouthpiece for the, the, the coaches at the grassroots to get back to USA Wrestling, uh, to voice opinions and concerns um, about the, the grassroots programs. Uh, they're also, it's broken up into pool coaches as, as well as developmental coaches. Uh, and, and so it creates equal representation from our national team coaches as well. Uh, then this, the second part of that is, and it's certainly a big part, is to relay pertinent and relevant information to the coaches from USA Wrestling and making sure that they're up on everything that we can possibly get to them by way of communication uh, through those regional representations. And, you know, we have... Um, once every month we have a conference call and we're usually discussing some of the, the hottest topics uh, of recent. Obviously, it, uh, you know, COVID has been a big one uh, and how to handle getting athletes and coaches back on the mats uh, in, a mo in, a, in a very responsible way. And the, the most difficult part of that obviously being is that we're also dealing with all the community standards and the differences in every state and those local communities. But uh, we're trying to be uh, proactive and stay ahead of those things, making sure that um, we're involved in anything pretty much that has to do with coaches. And uh, Zach Dominguez is the, the is the chairperson of our committee, and Zach does a wonderful job in sharing information and, and creating you know agendas for our meetings. And Mike, you're a big part of that, and uh, so much appreciate what you guys have done. But uh, the coaches council, honestly, you know, I was thinking about this today, preparing kind of for our call, uh, dates all the way back into the 1980s, and. Uh, I, Again, I'm dating myself, but I had a chance to actually be on the original foundation, the foundation of what the Coaches Council represented. And it all started back in the day when we were at these major events, the Cadet Nationals, the Junior Nationals, and we wanted to have conversation between the coaches and the officials. And we had these, what we call coaches philosophy meetings prior to these competitions. And out of that sort of arose the coaches council, which has been an evolutionary process over the years as well. But uh, it's been something that's been productive and with things like this podcast and so on, we want to grow that base and we want to make sure that people have a voice. We've created a web page as well. Um, and that web page uh, is a Facebook group. So if you have anything you'd like to add, please uh, join us on that group and, and sign up and make sure that you're communicating with us and so we can get that information out. And also on that webpage, since it's just being built, uh, we also are going to 
put on those pages uh, the individuals who are on the council. And so if people wanted to reach out to their individual representative from that particular region, they can do so. Yeah, Mike, can I, can I just add that, you know, we have three very, very important committees, our sport committees, our, our women's uh, wrestling committee, our freestyle wrestling committee, and our Greco-Roman wrestling committee. And those official titles may just be a little off, but we do have uh, coaches council representation mm -hmm. uh, on all of those committees. And I, I think it's important that, uh, you know, the coaches council has a seat in the board. Um, you know, we feel that, that getting everybody's, as does athletes have seats on the board and so forth, getting everybody's opinion is how in our volunteer structure is what made USA Wrestling the organization it is. It, it, we feel we're trying to be, um, you know, have most wrestling groups and levels have a, a input to the decision-making process. And, there, and the more information we have and the more good people we surround ourselves with, the better decisions will be in a better organization. Mike, I'm going to let you kind of wrap things up. But uh, from my perspective, uh, Bruce, it is absolutely an honor to have you with us today, especially on our first podcast. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the information gets out. And uh, I mean, I, I, it was just an exciting adventure to start this off with you as being president of USA Wrestling, being a 13-time world medalist, gold medalist uh, for USA Wrestling. Um, we couldn't have had a better guest. And so much appreciate your time. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, what we get to see, the leadership that you give us, are the things that help our sport grow. And, and we appreciate that leadership um, for all of us at the National Wrestling Coaches uh, Council, um, from USA Wrestling's National Coaches Education Program, and, and for our guest, Bruce Baumgartner. Um, all of us, thanks so much for your time. Well, well, thank you, Mike and Mike. I appreciate it. You know, I, again, I would just I start out thanking our volunteers, our coaches, the staff at USA Wrestling, I think, you know, it, everybody, um, uh, especially our volunteers and, and volunteer coaches, athletes, um, that, that's why we have a great organization, or I feel we have a great organization, it's because of the people. And I can tell you from uh, myself, and I'll speak for Rich Bender, we really do appreciate uh, the staff, our volunteers, the board members, the people that put the time into helping grow our sport and, and helping the boys and girls turn into uh, young men and young women and then turn into it to, uh, you know, full-fledged, I'll say, adults. But we really do appreciate uh, everybody's efforts in, in helping USA Wrestling uh, be a great uh, national governing body. Thanks so much. Thank you.